the father was downloading some, you know, ideas and some plans. And he was telling me basically that when he's about to do things, all he needs is available, willing people. That's it. That's all he needs. Amen. And he can do a lot with very little. Amen. Just a little will win the whole land. A little laven. Laven in the whole door. And there's kingdom laven. Amen. Laven is always in a, in a negative connotation. But in Matthew 13, Jesus makes it a positive thing. See, the kingdom of God is like laven, which the woman took and put in three measures of meal and until all was leavened. You understand this? So the kingdom of God also acts like leaven, just a little bit of it. You put it in, in three measures of meal. You put it in a city. You put it in a state and it will take over. There's a takeover grace Amen. in the kingdom teaching that we are doing now. God called the teaching of the Pharisees leaven. He said the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of the Herodians. So what about the leaven of Jesus? Must be his teachings, right? So kingdom teaching behaves like leaven. It begins to take over you. And leaven, if you steady leaven from the biological or whatever point of view, it breaks down stuff. It breaks it down. It consumes and it takes over. You understand this? So leaven has, has a takeover anointing. So you may think this, this, this may be a small gathering, or this may be a small setting. This is leaven. Amen. 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 And, and when leaven begins to take over, it takes over completely. Amen. Amen. And these teachings, I'm telling you, is going to keep you for years to come. Amen. God has been teaching us about the crown. Amen. Amen. And now, when we finish with that, God said, now you can move on to what? The rod or the, or the scepter. Amen. And this evening I propose that we just look at the doctrine of the iron rule and then we'll build up from there, all right? But you see, we need to understand what the iron rod is. But first, we need to know who gives us the iron rod. Which person of the Godhead releases this grace? You understand me? Let's go to Revelation chapter 2. Are you prepared to learn today? As we have been teaching, when you are a king, there are certain things that goes with your kingship. There are certain things that manifest. And I pray that with time, God will give us the liberty to deal with all the various aspects of your kingship. Even the clothes you wear. Even, the, even your eyes. Even the breath of your lips. I mean, the Bible calls your mouth the rod of your mouth. Amen. Even your feet. Hallelujah. Every, every part of when, when you were a king, the totality of your being is involved in executing the kingdom of God. You are listening to this. So, the more you understand about what your kingdom or your kingship is all about, the more you can manifest. You understand this? Somebody can be a king, but maybe a foolish king. A foolish king is an ignorant king. And the Bible says a wise servant is better than you know the foolish king. You understand this? So wisdom is understanding how God sees something, his plans, his purposes concerning anything. So this is his plans, his purposes concerning your kingship. What he has spoken concerning your kingdom stuff. So when you understand it, it becomes available. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Or you, or you receive authority when truth is revealed to you. Can I hear a big amen? amen? I'm in Revelations chapter 2. And I'm looking at, um, let's see, verse um, 25. Now, what is the color of the writing over there? Red. Is it in black? It is in red. So we know that Jesus is the one speaking here, right? And this is what he says in verse 25. But you have that which... And that which ye have already hold fast till I come. Amen. Amen. But I want us to read verse 26 and verse 27. And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him 
when I give power over the nations. How many want power over nations? This is some major stuff. God is not give, just giving you power over dawn. He's not giving you power just over the United States of America. He said, I want to give you power over nations. I want your influence to extend to the ends of the earth. Amen. So some will say, oh, come on, so if all of us are power of our nations, then who will who, who, rule what? No, you'll be given a special mandate that you have to execute. Maybe your mandate is a particular aspect of the kingdom which is uniquely given to you. Hallelujah. And whatever you do with that will touch the rest of the world. Amen. 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 So let's say if you are a man of prayer or you are an apostle of prayer, your prayer ministry will touch the whole world. If you have a peculiar teaching on the kingdom of God, you will be the person who imperially executes that particular doctrine or that word all over the world. You understand this? So whatever God has called you to do, he can make it international or global. He's going to globalize you right now. So when God says that if you overcome, he will make you global. How many want to be global? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I will give you power or really Authority, you know, God, Jesus gives what is it? A Susie or Dunamis. By the far majority, He gives what? A Susie. That went there, that power went there is actually a Susie. You see this? Now we have learned already that Jesus in Matthew 10, He gave to the 12 disciples power and authority, actually, was authority over all unclean spirits. To cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease, right? We know that Jesus also gave to the disciples in Luke 10 power to shut down the power of the enemy, or authority to tread on what serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. The Bible says, Nothing shall by enemies hurt you. There's an authority to walk in diplomatic immunity, to be vaccinated against the powers of darkness, where you can go anywhere. And, and witchcraft powers, so called powers, cannot affect you. Amen. You understand this? He also gave the disciples power to bind and to loose. He also gave to the uh, to um, Peter keys of the kingdom. All this was given by who? Jesus Christ. And today he says, Now I, Jesus, if you overcome, I will give you power over what? The nations. So there's something else that he gives. Are you understanding this? In fact, I looked into the Bible, I saw more than 40 different things that Jesus gives. About 40 different things that comes from the person, and comes from the authority, and comes from the office of Jesus Christ. As, as, as distinguished from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has stuff to give, alright? But Jesus, if you understand what he has to give, then you can receive it. How can you receive something you don't know? You understand this? So one thing he gives is imperial glory, authority, power over nations. Say, Father, give me power over nations. Amen. But having this authority, you need something to go with it. But when you are given the nations, now you have to rule them. You listening to this? He says, I'll give you power over the nations, right? And you see there's a semicolon over there, right? It's not a full stop. If it, if it was a full stop, then we know that that is it. But if there's a semicolon, then whatever is coming after that is connected to it. It's another aspect of what he's given. Look at verse 27. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he shall rule them. Who are the them? The nations. How is he going to rule them? With the rod of iron. Shall rod of iron. So again, here you have, you have the nations. And again, you can lose them if you don't know what to do with it. Amen. You can lose what God gives you if you don't know what to do with it. So God can give you the nations. And if you don't know how to rule them or put them under control, you are liable to lose them. You see this? You see, when uh, George Bush was president, his main policies in the last three, four years of his uh, reign was to make sure that he wins the next one. You understand this? So, whatever people do, they are trying to do something with it. Otherwise, you have just four years and then you are off. Are you, are you getting it? 
So when God gave Adam the well, he told him to keep it. Right? And to till it. Two things. Keep it and till it. Amen? So that's what he was doing, but he wasn't able to keep it. To keep something means to guard it. He wasn't able to guard the garden from the intrusion of Satan. And as a result, he lost what was given to him. Say, I must rule. I must manage. I must govern what God gives me. And I must increase that which he gives me. Glory be to God in this place. Amen. So to rule what God gives you, you need a particular instrument called the iron rod. I hope you get it. Amen. Now, to, 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 to get the nations or to beat them up, you need a sword. That's a different discussion. Amen. Now that you have warned them, the Bible says, occupy until I come. To occupy what has been conquered, you need the iron rod, right? Just write it down somewhere. To occupy what you have won or conquered, you need the iron rod. To occupy or to rule what I have conquered, I need the iron rod. Hallelujah. So the iron rod is a, is a very interesting instrument. It is a ruling instrument. Not necessarily a conquering instrument. I want you to understand this. Because if you don't understand this, you will mix up the scepter and the sword. You got it? Let's make this a little bit clearer. So when we read on, it says, um, He shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a porter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. We will, we will explain that some more, but let's go to Revelation 19. In Revelation 19, we know about the rider on the white horse. He has this many crowns on his head, eyes like a flame of fire, name read, nobody knows. Amen. But he himself. But um, let's look at verse 14. The armies which were in heaven following him, that the, the him being Jesus, upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth, Go with a sharp sword. You see this? That with it, with the sword, what will he do? He will smite the nations. See, warfare. warfare. This is warfare. He will smite the nations. This is the battle to possess the nation. Amen. There's a different, there's a rule of engagement where you're possessing or you're to possess something means to disinherit the former tenants or to throw out the former tenants, to cast them out, to dispossess them. That is the means to possess. So when Jesus, when he came to the earth, he said, I didn't come with, you know, uh, to bring peace. I came with a sword. So he went around casting out devils, right? But then you realize that after he won the land, he, he needs the iron rod to rule it. So, in fact, if you look at the word rule in the New Testament, it is a shepherd um, implement. It is actually used, the word also means to feed my sheep. When Jesus said to Peter, feed my sheep, the word there is rule them. Now, in the church, when we hear the word rule, all we think about is having a position and exercising authority over people. You know, and, and you are the big guy. I'm the one over the mics. If you don't like me, and get a good mic. You see this? No. When you have authority, Jesus said you don't exercise authority as the unbelievers do. You don't lord it over God's inheritance like the, like the um, unbelievers do. You must be a servant king. You must be a servant at heart. And Jesus demonstrated the way he took off his clothes, wore a towel around his waist, and washed the feet of his disciples. That is part of ruling. Amen. It takes a lamb to rule. It takes a lion to conquer. Someone to be lions on the throne. It's the lamb who sits on the throne. Are you understanding this? The Bible says that the lion has prevailed so a lion fights and wins. 
but it's a lamb that rules. You have to be a lamb, a meek king, to rule. Are you getting it? Hallelujah. I mean, for those who know a little bit of history, how many know about uh, Philip? Uh, this 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 ruler of uh, Greece or somewhere is it is it is it Greece? And this guy, when he would build up, he was a very very powerful ruler, and he was always beating up other countries. And when he comes to beat you up, burn burn the city down, you know, take all the women, kill people, he was very brutal in his reign. And one of the wise men of his era said, "You will beat up nations, you will win nations, but you will not be able to rule them." He was never able to rule the nations he won. His son was able to rule it. You don't realize that David wasn't a good ruler. I know this is a little bit tough for some to understand. But David wasn't a very good ruler. Even his own, his, 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 his own son could poke holes in his judgments. He said, you know what? If I was king, I would have seen through this mess. I would have given the right judgments. David was a warrior. You understand this? He was a mighty warrior. He could not build. Shout, he couldn't build. He wanted to build a temple for God. God says, no. You are a fighter. You are a warrior. That's your job. Amen. It says, that's for Solomon. He is the person who will build. So his name is Solomon, a man of peace. And you know what? This guy ruled nations beyond the extent of David's own domain without firing a single gun. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Instead of bringing the whole army to fight you, you marry your daughter and it was over. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. So I want you to get this understanding that conquering is different from ruling. For example, when Apostle David came over, he said the principality is broken. Now go and take the spoils. That is a loaded statement. That means the conquering has been done. Now you need to go and rule. You need to go and occupy. Take over the place. Take the spoil. Take the souls. Hit the streets. Do crusades. You understand that? So conquering is different from what? Ruling. To conquer, you need a sword. To rule, you need an iron rod. Amen. Hallelujah. He shall, with it, he, he should smite the nations. We are more than conquerors. I am more than a conqueror. I am more than a conqueror. We need to learn how to rule. Jesus has conquered. He has spoiled the principalities. Thank you very much. He has spoiled the principalities and powers. He made a public show of them. And he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now you go. Go and do what? Rule. Occupy. If the church becomes aware of what the iron rod is, oh boy. Man, are we going to win this place? Say, I need an iron rod to rule in my own life, in my own city, in my own family. I have to learn how to use the Lord to squash rebellion, to quell rebellion, to silence dissension. Hallelujah. We need to learn how to do this. We need to learn how to rule, how to feed the sheep, and how to keep out the lion. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The next point that has to be made is that the iron Lord is not a priesthood domain. It is the domain of the kingdom. You understand this? Because the priest is supposed to take care of the house of God. Soldiers, when they come home, do you see them walking around with their pistols and bazookas and grenades all over their body? No. Americans are just in their barracks. Amen. Whenever there's a traffic accident, do you, do you see the soldiers going to take care of that? No. It's the police. When the police have more authority here than, than the soldiers. Yeah, yeah. They are near barracks. Mm -hmm. I'll be very nervous if I see a soldier walking around with a grenade in his hand. <laughs> you understand me? Yeah. No. They are in their barracks because they are home. Yeah. But when they're outside, when they're fighting the wars of America, 
It's a whole different mindset. They are in their elements outside of the country. When they are going out to fight. Amen. The, the, the iron rod is a kingdom implement to maintain order in the kingdom. To ensure order in the kingdom. Amen. And if you understand this, it will help you. Let's go to Re Revelation 12. And we'll build this up. Amen. Revelation 12. Say, Father, open my eyes. Grant me revelation. Open my ears to hear this word in Jesus' name. You know about this woman who was with child sitting in the heavens right, with the crown of 12 stars? You know about that story. The red dragon is ready to eat up the child that she's about to give birth to, right? This is a bad situation. Verse 4. And he still, now the dragon still drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as any time a king was about to be born, the dragon goes into operation. The dragon is very, very interested in the kings. He tried to take out Moses. He tried to take out Jesus. Both of them were kings. Both of them beat up nations. Amen? We have heralds and pharaohs of our day and our time. We don't want you to walk into your kingship. But today we have been caught up to the throne. See, I need to be caught up to the throne. Verse 5. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule the nations with the rod of iron. And her child was caught up, her puzzle or ratchet, unto God and to his throne. If you are connected to the throne, the dragon can't get you. The reason why the dragon is eating up some people is that they have been caught up to the earth. They are operating in the earth zone. You are to operate in the heavens. You are to legislate from the heavens. We are born from above. God's throne is established in the heavens. Your mind must be set on things above. Your members on the earth must be mortified. It must be crucified. To the extent that you are alive on the earth, <laughs> is the extent where the devil has, you know, inroads into your life. You get it? So when you go to Colossians 3, the Bible says, let your mind be set on things above where Christ is seated. Maybe we need to go there. Colossians 3. See, I must sit in the heavens. Where was Satan cast down to anyway when Michael and his angels fought against him? He was cast to the earth. And there was tribulation in heaven, right? The angels were dancing. And what did they say? Woe to the inhabitants of the earth. The Bible says those who are of the earth are earthly and speak of earthly things. That's carnal people. A carnal Christian is, is operating on dangerous grounds. On icy roads. He's living dangerously. You got to elevate. Amen. She brought forth the man. I said Colossians 3 1, right? Do we have it up? Colossians chapter 3. It says, If you be risen, are you risen? Hallelujah. Some people are dead. <laughs> Amen. Come now, fleshy, sensual, devilish. The three stages of defilement. If ye then be written, be risen, sorry, with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is. Where was the man child caught up to? Caught up to heaven. Amen. Where Christ seated on the right hand of God. Verse 2. Hallelujah. Set your affection. Oh God, this is not my topic. But set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. He says, Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, for the devil has come down to you. Who was the one that the, that the dragon was able to chase? The woman and her other children. The woman had other children. And they were persecuted by the dragon. Yes, they ran away, but they were fugitives. But there was one child. That the that dragon had nothing, could not touch at all. 
this child was caught up to the throne. Say, I need to be caught up to the throne. Set your affection, your desires. What do you like? You like things on the earth or things in heaven. What, what makes you tick? What excites you? I remember when I was at Knoxville, we would have a game and like, um, you know, you know, for all states, pay the man in when he was the quarterback of uh, Tennessee volunteers. You know the volunteers? When I was at the Knoxville, that's when we had the national championship. I had to be there for them to win the national championship. It would not have been possible for them to win if I was in there. That's the only time, the only time they came anywhere close to winning the national championship. Because I was there, amen. <laughs> amen. But um, in those days, when, when we go to the stadium, I noticed something very interesting. I mean, these guys will go and sleep outside. The students, we had a certain allotment of tickets. And it was very limited, you know. If you don't get a ticket early, you'll be in a nosebleed session. And I'm telling you, no matter how cold it was, these dudes will sleep outside in their sleeping bags. Just to be in line. Like Best Buy, when they have a new Apple, see how they will, they will stay in line. No matter how cold to get that, whatever it is they have to sell. And then when the day comes when we are to go into the stadium, as we are getting closer to the stadium, there's a sense of excitement and jubilation. And you see this alumni, these old guys who are in the school, who are, you know, just, they are shouting, they are drinking, and, and they're all friendly. Hey, how you doing? High five. And there's this, and this exuberance in the air. And they'll go to the stadium hours before the game begins. Hours. Some of them would have driven long distances just to come and sit in the stadium to watch people chasing a, a, a rubber ball. A bag of air. Chasing it left and right, back and forth. And when they get inside the stadium, oh boy, oh boy. And the band, they have a praise and worship team. Go rock it up, tum 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 tum. Everyone, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, the, the whole place is white, they are happy, blacks are happy. Who told you white people don't know how to dance? They are excited. Every place is rocking, the place is rocking. Hallelujah. And when there's a touchdown, oh boy, the first time there's a touchdown, my back, bam, they slap me on the back. The whole stadium is rocking. And then you go to the same people, you see them in church, and they're like, you know, looking at their clock. This is the whole ceremony. This, this is ours. And after the ceremony, there's an online session. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm telling you, some people have their affection down here, I'm telling you. My question is, where is your affection? What do you like? What makes you excited? I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. <laughs> and they in the house of God is better than a thousand elsewhere. If, if our David was even envious of the birds that had made their nest in the temple. He says, I wish I would be one of them. Hallelujah. Set your affection. Say my affection. Must be set on things above. Not on things on the earth. Okay, verse 3. If that is so, what will have to happen? The Bible says, For you are dead, and your life is where? And where is Christ? And where is he sitting? So where is your life? It's not here. So the devil comes and he's getting you. That means you are alive. <laughs> that means you got some things that haven't yet come under control. That means there are some things in you that are still alive and kicking. And verse 4 tells us the things we need to kill for us to be able to ascend. For flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. There are some things that can't go out there. Verse 4 says, For when Christ is your life shall appear, you shall appear with him in glory. Because you are with him anyway. Verse 5. Wow. It says mortify. Mortify means kill. It means crucify, destroy, execute. 
Modify therefore your members which are on the earth. And it tells you what it is. Fornication. Fornication always comes first. Amen. Amen. If you look at the lust of the flesh, adultery, sexual immorality, it seems to always come first. Amen. Amen. Fornication. Uncleanness. Uncleanness. Amen. Some have created an unclean environment in their home. The music. Oh, it's my child. But your child is in your house. You got a rule over him. Yes. You're having no Rastafarian uh, um, sound in, in him. No. Yes. Amen. 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 No, why, why should you have the Rastafarian songs here? They're very strong. See something coming out of your mouth. Yes. Amen. Yes. No, you're having no rock music in here. Yes, Amen. Amen. No, I ain't having those, those DVDs in this house. You're creating an unclean environment that creates an airport for demons to land on. Yes. Uncleanness, shout uncleanness. uncleanness. Computer, where you go, the sites you visit when you go to their computer. Uncleanness, inordinate affection, unclean desires, evil concupiscence. Hallelujah. This is the desires gone AWOL. Covetousness. Wanting things, amen, that you don't have the ability to get. Being greedy, grasp, I must have this dress. I must have this shit. No matter what. Amen. May God divorce us from this earth, the things on the earth. That made the gravitational forces of the earth wane. And the more you visit the secret room, the gravitational forces of all these five things will break off your life. Amen. Can I hear a big amen? amen? We need to be caught up to the throne. Because the Bible says this man child was to rule the nations with the rod of iron. And the, and the rod is sent from Zion. Say the rod is sent from Zion. Guys, there are different rocks. There's a set of wickedness, a set of darkness, amen? But our rod is processed in heaven. The iron rod is sent forth from Zion. Can you, can you say that? Say the iron rod, the iron rod. is processed in heaven. heaven. The Bible says that the Lord shall send forth thy rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. This is Psalm 110. God says he's sending forth the rod of your strength. Out of where? Zion is the city of God. That's where Jehovah God lives. New Jerusalem. The general assembly. The church of the firstborn. Innumerable angels. Jesus Christ. The mediator. All these things. Your rod must come out of the secret place. Amen. 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 Now the question is why is the iron rod? A kingdom implement. Why is it in the domain of the kingdom versus the priesthood? Why is that? Look at 1 Kings 6 verse 7. 1 Kings chapter 6 verse 7. The Bible says when Solomon was building the temple, you, you could not hear an iron tool in there. There was no iron tool or implement or instrument being used. And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready, before it was brought thither. What is happening in the church today is that we have warfare in the church. Because we didn't build the kingdom first. We built the church before the kingdom. We put the horse before the cart. We got to deal with first things first. Kingdom, then priesthood. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then you can add the priesthood. Then you can add the church. Amen? So David had fought all the battles. You don't build a temple in the midst of all crisis. Some would say, oh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah built a wall. Amen? You don't build a temple in crisis. You don't build a temple when there's warfare. That is why there's a lot of church split outs. Many churches are breaking up, can be solid, 
People come in and out, can't stay. Why? Because the foundations are faulty. It wasn't done the right way. We have to, you know, uproot everything, go down to the foundations, and we do this whole thing. You understand me? We got to get this huge, whatever, uh, machine and come and uproot the whole thing and redo the whole thing again. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. This house must be set on the rock. Amen. It must be set on kingdom. Amen. I listen. Your life must be reset Amen. for you to have the right parody. Amen. Kingdom must come first. Amen. When you begin to experience the kingdom of God as a first in your life, the Bible opens up to you in ways you never did. Because order has come into your life, now things can flow in and out on him. Amen. The Bible says, before it was born, Peter, so that there was neither hammer nor axe, nor any tool of nor any tool of what? Iron heard in the house while it was in building. Church was built after Jesus conquered Satan. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. In all of the gospels, Jesus referred to the church after he was done with his main ministry. And he always spoke in the futuristic sense and he spoke about the church. He says, I will build my church. He says, tear this temple down and in three days I'll do what? I'll put it back up. So when you go to the book of Acts, you see church, 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 church. Very little reference to even the kingdom. But when you go to Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, there's kingdom all over the place. 55 times in Matthew, 45 times in Luke alone. And about only three times is the church referred to. When you go to the book of Acts, church, 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 church. You understand how this works? Kingdom has to be built first and then the church. When they moved away from kingdom, church began to become wobbly, even in the book of Acts. Can I hear a big amen? amen. The Bible says they couldn't hear any tool of iron in the house. Say in the house, yeah. there shouldn't be any tool of iron. Amen. No gossip. No backbiting. Backbiting is murder. Hatred is murder. You understand me? Anger. All these things. Those are. <laughs> the Lord shall strike through kings in his wrath. So your anger is supposed to be harnessed in the right place, not in the house of God. Amen. Hallelujah. No tool of iron was heard in the house. While it was in building. First Kings 6 verse 7. Amen. If I let's go to Exodus 20. Verse 25. Are we coming home? So this is just a teaching really. Just to show you how things are. Before we run off. Amen. Verse 24. Again. The iron word is to rule the kingdom. You understand this? The iron rod is to rule the kingdom. The kingdom has. <laughs> Amen. The church is a good place. The kingdom has goats. Has all kinds of people in it. You understand that? The kingdom has. If you read Matthew 13. Even tiles are in the kingdom. Fish that was brought out of the sea. They bought fish of all kinds. That's the kingdom. The church is where the fish is processed. This one goes here, this one goes there. So when Philip was doing the kingdom, but he was bringing everybody in there, including Simon the sorcerer. Yes, yes, yes. And then Peter comes with the church staff. He says, in, this guy doesn't belong here. So the kingdom is to bring the people in. And when they come in, the church, the house of God, the hospital, the infirmary, this is the place where we remove the skin of the fish. Amen. This is, this is where we do deliverance. We, we begin to clean up the fish and kill it. This is where we kill the fish. Amen. But when you're winning the fish, it's like everything is fine. And, and God will save you. God will heal you. God will da 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 da. When you come in here, we kill you. <laughs> Hallelujah. Church is where we kill you. Amen. And Paul, Paul, Paul says, I died there. Jesus said, you got to take up your cross and follow me. The Bible says, mortify your flesh. Mortify your members. 
It is done in the church. In the kingdom, we win everybody. Everybody goes. Kingdom is so different. Kingdom is a gathering point. We just we just take the net and go out and just everything we do, we just pull it out. That's kingdom. Church, we separate, we clean up, all that kind of stuff. I hope you are getting some wisdom. An altar of earth thou shalt make unto me. Thou shalt sacrifice thereon thy burnt offering, thy peace offering, thy sheep, thy oxen. In all places where I record my name, I will come unto thee. And I will bless thee. This is church. See, this is church stuff. Look at verse 25. And if thou make me an altar of stone, thou shalt not build it of what? Hewn stone. For if thou lift any what? If you lift your tool on it, what have you done? You polluted it. You see why there's a lot of pollution in the church? The Bible says where there is strife and contention, there's confusion in every evil work. We can't have strife in the house of God. Amen. If you, if that's what the Bible says, you can't even offer your gift without settling scores. Yeah. See, if you're going to bring a gift, and if you really want heaven to recognize the gift, if you want heaven to endorse the gift, if you want heaven to say, okay, all this $1,000 that Helen brought into the kingdom of God, all 1000 of it is being accepted. You know God does not accept certain offerings. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It says your offerings are a stench in my nostrils. Is it never Bible? So he says you must settle scores. If somebody has ought against you, you must go deal with them real quick. He says, leave your altar, leave, leave the gift. Because some of you will forget and not come up with a gift. Jesus is so smart. He says, leave the gift. <laughs> then you go. <laughs> Solve your problem and then come and offer your gift. Amen. Who, who, who take off your gifts? Who know? It's like you know, you go to Walmart, you go with your bag, you leave it somewhere. Who take your it for? Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. It says, don't lift any tool on it. If you do it, you have polluted it. That is why the kingdom is so important. The kingdom prepares the stone outside. It has to be prepared outside. It has to. Even Jesus to fight the battle with sin. He had to go outside the city. I'm telling you, you must understand the difference between the kingdom and the priesthood. You must understand the dichotomy of a believer, the dual nature of the believer. You are a king and what? A priest. And what flows into which? Are you getting it? And I know you are getting it. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Yeah. I want us to come at this point again. Let's go to Deuteronomy 27 verse 5. Deuteronomy chapter 27 verse 5. Are we there? Hallelujah. In Exodus 20 verse 25 it says, don't Use any tool on it, right? Well, someone said, okay, well, Pastor, I didn't see any eye on it. Okay. Then you got a valid point. So let's go on. There and there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God. An altar of stones. Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. Paul said that the church at Corinth was carnal or fleshly because there was strife in that church. He said because of that there were babies. A baby church or a church, that, a, a church of toddlers. You know you can have adults who are still toddlers. Mm. Mm. And Paul called the church at Corinth babies because they had camps. Some were for Peter. Some were for Paul, some were for Apollos. And there was all kinds of stuff going on in the church, carnality. And they were so spiritual at the same time. The Bible says you come behind with no gifts. And yet, Paul called them carnal because of the strife and the contention that existed in them. Brother, sister, we're going to stamp that out of this place. Amen. I'm telling you. If I, if I get a shift, I mean, if I smell gossip or contention, I, I, will, I will snuff it out. Amen. Because we, we, 
we, we gotta grow. We need some serious believers. You understand me? We, we can't have this, this, oh, he stepped on me. Ah, ah, what is that woman like? Is that woman like? Get over it. Hallelujah. You must get over it. Your leg isn't dead. You're still walking. Yeah, you may walk with a little limb, but the limb is because you want everybody to see that you were stepped on.
people to have the best in the land. That's what he told me. We need to ask big. Say, I must ask big. At times we ask based on our circumstances, based on our upbringing. If you got a problem, you need to travel and see. Broaden your horizons. Broaden your... But just come out of your tents. Okay, look towards the heavens. Now, count the stars. That's how your children are. You, 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 you think of, you're going to be like one of the nations. You're going to be a father of nations. And I need to beef up your expectation. You got to look up. Your prayers, your expectation must be established by heaven. Hallelujah. Heaven must set the parameters of your prayer request. What does God say he's giving you? Ask what he's saying he's going to give to you. So I'm not just asking for one nation. I'm asking for what? Nations. And, and when you have nations, now you need an iron or wrong. The iron one is an imperial equipment. You need an imperial glory to rule nations. Amen. He says, ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for the inheritance that must pass of the earth for thy possession. Verse 9, quickly. Verse 9. Oh, hallelujah. Thou shalt bring them with the rod of iron. And thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vest. Say, I'm going to dash some people into pieces. You see, when God gives you the land, you're going to deal with some nefarious elements. And you're going to have to deal with that. You got to break them. You got to have that mindset. David knew how to break down the will of his enemies. He knew how to destroy them. He says, I, I didn't get up until I beat them small and dust. How did he do that? Oh, that was... He would take, uh, uh, like this thing using the farm, that combined harvester. And he will roll it over the people with an iron threshing teeth, just cut them up into tiny tiny pieces. Yeah. That's how his name spread out all over the world, but for his for his uh, viciousness. Because iron refers to the strength of your kingdom. Iron breaks down. Look at Daniel 2, verse 40. We just look at definitions, say definitions. definitions. We just want to get in the anatomy, the, the elements of the iron rod. What does it mean? Because when you understand this, when you hold that thing in your hand, you know what to do with it. Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. You can do some real damage with it. The Bible says the fourth kingdom, that's the Roman Empire, shall be strong as. When we talk about iron, we're talking about strength. A kingdom must be strong. That means a kingdom can be weak. We need strong kingdoms. A kingdom that doesn't break under pressure. A king must be fenced with iron. See, a king must be fenced with iron. That is in 2 Samuel 23. That word fenced means must be filled with iron. The Bible says Joseph, God wanted him to do a great work. He was going to rule over nations. But before he could do that, he had to stiffen the guy. The Bible says, until the word of God came, he was laid in iron. The Hebrew actually says that iron entered his soul. Mm. May iron enter your soul. When iron enters your soul, you're no longer a weak person. You're no longer emotional. You're, you're no longer throwing tantrums. You know how our toddlers, those two to five, when they get mad, then they will throw themselves on the floor and they just, their whole body just goes all over the place and just, just, just mess. Hallelujah. Me, me, toddlers, they can't handle me. Hallelujah. Me, I'm just, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just take care of that. Hallelujah. But they throw tantrums. And there are Christians who throw tantrums. I'm going to church again. Get away from here. That pastor don't like the way he looks at me all the time. Every time he talks, he's talking about me. I don't like him at all. Look at the way he talks. Every example is about me. Everything he says, who, who told you is about you? How do you know I come here trying to take you down? Give me a break. Give me a break. Amen. Amen. Christians throw tantrums. Do you know that? When a Christian is doing a tantrum, you won't sit there for two weeks. I'll show him how much he needs me. I'm telling you. Amen. 
once I gave an example about something and I went to visit somebody and the person was angry with me. And um, come to find out, he said the example I used in our speech was about him. I said, oh my God. I said, I can be honest with you, please. What I said wasn't about him. Apparently, I went to his house and I saw a treadmill. Now, actually, I didn't even see it. My mind didn't go on it. And I was preaching once, and I was talking about the fact that, oh, you go around on a treadmill, and I would just go and pray three hours, and I'll get more strength than you. Now, I wasn't thinking about him. It didn't come because of him. He says it's because of him I gave that example. So he's angry with me. Pulled his whole family out of the church because of the treadmill. Yeah. I mean, how, how crazy can we, can we, can we, can we be? Hmm? We cannot lose a fight over a tantrum. Because your tantrum can poison the whole atmosphere. And somebody who will come here with a debilitating disease will go back home sick. Because you have polluted the air. We can't look at what Achan did. Achan, he was the only one person, only soldier who messed up. But his folly affected the whole nation. Amen. We have to be strong. Do you know how you know that you are strong? Do you know how you want me to show you how, how I know you are strong? Yeah. When, 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 when the pastor or somebody, you know, really says something to you and just messes you up. Amen. And then you get over it before the sun falls down. You say, oh, it doesn't matter. Then you are strong. When somebody steps on your leg and they say, oh, sorry for stepping on my leg. Then you are arriving. <laughs> the person that stepped on your leg, you say, oh, I'm sorry that I put my leg in your way. Uh -huh. Then you are arriving. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Somebody messes you up the next day, you are the same way with the person. You haven't you have changed the inflection or tone of your voice. If I am going over that board, just to make sure the person feels nice around you, feels comfortable with you. You are right. Hallelujah. When somebody messes you up and, 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 and someone will say, Did you hear what they said? Say, actually, I didn't hear what they said. You, 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 your, your, your ears are so refined, they filter stuff out. Amen. And that's when we enter into your head. Hallelujah. 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 Are you all learning this? Yeah. That is how an onion enters your soul. Because Joseph was a very nice guy. Must have been a daddy's boy. That they won't let him go out to take care of the sheep. Always keep him at home. Amen. Giving him beautiful clothes. Cut off many colors. Amen. And, and gives him the, the opportunity to share his dreams. Guys, I got I to gotta, I gotta show this guy up a little bit. The next time, Joseph, how old was he? 17 years old, right? 17 years old. He's a slave. The Bible says he was laid in iron. He was shackled behind camels and hauled to Egypt. How to stand in the slave line. They had to look at his teeth and all that kind of stuff. Sold to Potiphar. He didn't just end up being a supervisor. It took him time to be a supervisor. He earned. He, he worked so hard. The supervisor said, I like this guy. Let him be the supervisor. He earned his stripes. And just when everything became comfortable, when just when he had made it, the master put everything in his hands, the wife, the wife begins to look at him. Because the word Potiphar means Enoch. So an Enoch can't take care of the wife. So the wife is going to need attention. So who is he going to look for? Joseph is a very handsome guy. The Bible says he was fair in body. And fair, I mean, he was, the guy was brilliant and, and Brad Pitt can't hold the torch to Joseph. I'm telling you. No, he can't. Joseph was a hunk. Beautiful guy. The Bible said the woman made eyes at him. Hallelujah. The woman said, no, there's nobody in this house. There's nobody. There's nobody. There's no need for reprisal. You don't, you don't need to worry about anything. Joseph runs away. He's falsely a child. Now he's in prison. And he still has a good attitude. He says, why are you looking so sad? 
What's going on? He has been falsely charged, he's in prison, and yet he's so much in control of himself, he's not crying about it. He's actually look, look, looking out for other people. He said, tell me your dream. Let, let me help you out with your dream. Just tell me. Hallelujah. He was able to solve other people's problems whilst he was in prison. His ministry was not tied up to the circumstance. He didn't serve God based on how he felt or based on his present circumstances. Prison or no prison, he served people. And because of that, he was still elevated in prison. The next thing we hear, he is second in command to Father. May God strengthen you. Amen. God was going to use Jeremiah to do a great work. So he said in Jeremiah 1 verse 18, I want us to go to Jeremiah 1 verse 18. He said, Jeremiah, for this work I have to do with you, rather you are too soft. I need to talk to him a little bit. Look, if you read about Jeremiah, he had a nice girlfriend. And God said, you are not, you are not going to marry God told Jeremiah, you will not marry. Wow. Man, I mean to be so fortunate. If God was coming and tell me, Paul, you are not to marry, he has messed me up. Ah, I wouldn't want to be so bad. I said, God, okay, then take me out now. Just take me to heaven. You know, take me out now. Just, just forget it. Can't do it. Amen. It's not good for that's I'll, I'll, I'll tell God what you said. It's not good for man to be able. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I will remind him. He that finded a wife, find what? A good thing. God said to Jeremiah, you will not have a wife. Ha 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 ha. Woo, man. Look at this. For behold, this is God speaking to Jeremiah. He says, behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city, a iron pillar, <laughs> embracing walls, you will be a one-man wrecking team. You'll be a terminator. Mm -hmm. you, will, you will take down the whole land. Mm -hmm. Nobody can stand against you. He says, I'll make you an iron pillar against the whole land. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that? Against the kings of Judah. Against the princes thereof. Against the priests and against the people of the land. He says, Jeremiah, nobody can take you down. I'm going to make you so strong. You are a brazen wall. You are an iron pillar. You are strong. Nobody can break you down. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. For you to have access to the iron rod, God has to make you to iron. Amen. You must be fenced with iron. Amen. Iron will enter your soul. You get to the place where you are dead to yourself. Amen. Dead to relationships. Amen. Dead to your father. Dead to your mother. Dead to your brothers. Dead to your sisters. Dead to your children. Hallelujah. When you get to this place, you have overcome. God can entrust you with the iron rod. Now he can use you as an iron rod to bring down resistance, to bring down rebellion, to bring down opposition, to subdue the enemy. Because otherwise, when he's using you, you will break under pressure. When God came to Ezekiel, he said, the people I'm sending to, they are very, very stubborn. Their foreheads are, are like a like, uh, flint. I'm going to make your forehead a base of stronger than flint. For God to use you, you have to be of a stronger material than those he's sending you to. Because they'll try to break you down. Oh yeah. The world will try to break you down. The church, the priests will try to break you down. The people of the land will try to break you down. Demonic kings will try to break you down. So God, before he sends you out, has to strengthen you. He said to Joshua, not a single man can stand before you. Be strong and of good courage. See, I will not break down under pressure. I will not break down. I will be strong. Even if the heat of persecution comes, I will not wait. I am an iron pillar. Hallelujah. God wants to use you. My last one used you for just two years and then you break down. He wants to use you for the long haul. And for that, he was sitting like David. David is a shepherd boy. He receives the oil. He's the best guy. Everything is nice. Kills Goliath. 
I met a guy, everybody loves David. Now Spears have been to nothing. Spears. By the best archer in the whole nation. So, the Benjamins were known to fire their swords and fire their spears at a hair. A normal hair. But the Bible says David void the sword two times. I mean, he almost died several times. And yet, he's not offended with the sword. Can you withstand pressure like that? If you can, you can go with us a long haul. God will use you mightily. You will take down nations, guys. But how can you go to India if you are scared of one tiny tiny witch? <laughs> huh? Then you don't make it in India. You have to be so tough. You can look at someone, a sorcerer, and say, you are going to die if you don't take care. You have to be like, and Paul says, you're going to be blind and not see for a season. You have to be like Peter, who can use the iron rod even against Ananias and Sephira. Bam! Ananias is dead. Bam! Sephira is dead. Can you do that? <laughs> Amen. Maybe Friday we'll deal with the wisdom about the iron rod, the wisdom of it. When we are done with this study, my good gracious, you will all pray for the iron rod. You will ask and say, God, I need this thing. You got to rule your life. Yeah. Must let us sin rule over you. You yeah. must rule over it. Yeah. You must rule your circumstances. You can't allow snakes to be coming into your house and messing yeah. up with No. Yeah. Those parent victories must be over. Yeah. You can't be winning and then losing and winning and losing. That kind of stuff must stop. Yeah. You need that iron rod. Because when God has given you a line, you need that to keep those things out of your house. Yeah. And keep those copiers out. Yeah. You need the iron rod in your life. Yeah. And then to also wage war. To go out there and make sure the nations are obedient by word and deed. Amen. Yeah. I need the iron rod. Um, Jeremiah, um, no, sorry, Daniel 2, verse 40. If you want to understand, I want to leave this verse with you. This is what the iron is. Number one, the fourth kingdom shall be what? Strong as. See, iron is strong. For as much as iron breaketh in pieces, the iron rod breaks in pieces. It quells rebellion. It smashes opposition. It destroys any obstruction to the will of God in your life. It breaks in pieces. And what else does it do? And it subdueth some things. The iron rod is an all encompassing equipment. It can handle any form, any manifestation, any type, any kind of opposition. The Bible says that be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue. Before you can have dominion, you need the iron rod to subdue all things. See, I must subdue all things. If it's an arrow flying by night, if it's, if it's, a, if it's a pot in the sea, if it's an astral pot, if it's which, Necromancy, bam. Religious spirit, bam. Fornication, bam. Whatever it is, bam. Whatever, bam, bam, bam. It says smash in pieces. And, and the way the word is used, if you go to Psalm 2, it says you smash in pieces. When you go to Jeremiah and Isaiah, those prophets say that when you smash in pieces, there will not be even a little left to take the coal. That means that the iron rod can smash into irreparable pieces. Pieces that you can't put back together again. How many want to completely destroy the enemy in your life? You don't want the enemy to regroup, to refine. When the iron rod is executed, the world has to take all the chaff away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. When it can't pick up, you know, pieces of stuff, it has to be pick up with chaff. So do it all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and what? Bruise. Say, Father, I need the iron one in my life to break things down, to subdue all things. To subdue all things. Grant me this grace tonight to subdue all things. There are some things in my life that is opposing your will in my life. And I 
need the iron rod to bring order in my life, to bring order in my family, to bring order in my city, to bring order in my country. In the name of Jesus, I want us to begin to pray. Let's now, our Father, I release the iron rod over this city, around this state, around this country. I break down every principality, every power of darkness in Jesus' name. I decree that this city shall not be our country. I decree that the people in this land will not be pieces in that country in Jesus' name. I smash every country in this city cooking up the potentials of your people. I smash down every evil pot in Jesus' mighty name. Every opposition to the kingdom of God, I smash it. Every adversary of our financial gates, I break you down in the name of Jesus. Every adversary at the gate, I smash that opposition in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. Every adversary at the media gate, I smash down that opposition. I smash it down in the name of Jesus. I execute the iron rod in the Supreme Court of the United States of America and I decree that there shall be no law that will come out that will undermine the will of God that no perverse spirit can prevail in the corridors of power that foul spirit of homosexuality I take the iron rod and I smash that agenda in Jesus' name I smash that agenda in Jesus' name I smash that agenda in Jesus' name. I command every council of the human rights campaign to be turned into foolishness in Jesus' name. I command the council of the homosexual agenda to be turned into foolishness in the name of the Lord Jesus. I raise up the center of the living God against that spirit of bondage, against mass incarceration in the United States of America. I decree that in a year, prisons shall be emptied. In the name of Jesus, Maka Buti Kabila, Maruki Dimba Kura Diki Banu, Mariki Bandoko Rombo Reki Bea, Maka Ruka Dimbi Niki, Mareke Baku Ribi Nika Buta Kibi Niki, Mareke Banu Kabuku Kuri Bidia, Yeke De Maburu Kadimbi Niki, we march against the financial gates of this city. We smash down every gate of poverty. We smash down every elder at the gates of the financial sector in Jesus' name. Every evil elder at the financial gates of this city, at the financial gates of North Carolina, I smash down your opposition. I command finances to be loose. I command buildings to be loose. I command lands to be loose. In the name of Jesus, I command this edict to be a standing order and I release the iron rod to smash every opposition to our finances, every opposition in the name of Jesus to our breakthrough. I come against every discord in your marriage. I come against every attack on your marital life. I smash every opposition, every strange man in your life. I take the iron rod and I smash that strange visitor in Jesus' name. Say in the name of Jesus, every part of darkness coming against my life, coming against the marital life, I smash it in Jesus' mighty name. Every strange man in my life, I release the iron rod against you right now. I smash in the name of Jesus. Every strange man in my life, I release and I execute the iron rod against you. I smash you to pieces in the name of Jesus. Let your voice, let your voice. Papa, take you. I execute the iron rod in every household of this ministry. I take the iron rod and I move into every house and I overturn every demonic pot. I smash every demonic pottery 
in the name of Jesus. Makabandu kabundu, mare kabude kurumbu, mare kabandu kabudu kurumbu, mare kabudu kabudu kurumbu. As much strife, as much contention, as much envy, as much nemesis, as much seditions, as much divisions, as much discord, as much the whisper, as much those that say discord among people, as much kabuki kibia, maruka dimbiya, makuru madani, maruka dia. Maru kibi bini, maru kabeni te, maru kibini maru kurembo aki, maru kibia, maru kurembo rembe. Every attack, even in the atmosphere, I smash it. Peripheral forces, principalities, powers of Britain, in this arena, in this region, I overthrow you. I smash your little centers. I break the center of the wicked. In the name of Jesus, Maka Biki Manu, Mary Kibina, Mane Korembo Rembiata. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Say thank you, Father, for the iron rod. Thank you that you're releasing the iron rod in my life. Thank you that I'm receiving authority and power. Over nations. From today, I ask for the nations. I ask for the ends of the earth for my possession. Give me a vision, Father, of my land. Show me my inheritance. Show me the countries that you are giving me rulership over. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.